Hello, everyone, and we've reached the last panel for today. I feel like we could have um, several more days of content and discussion, which is, I guess, a really good problem to have. In this last panel, we're going to be looking at urban pathways for using biochar. This year, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies funded urban biochar product, projects in seven cities around the world. Following funding for Stockholm's 2014 Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies Mayor's Challenge um, with a biochar project. These projects in these seven cities around the world are turning plant waste from parks and homes, um, everything from grass clippings to trees or limbs into biochar, which are then made available to local residents for their use, much like urban composting programs, but crucially with the added carbon removal benefits. Our speakers will share their experience working on these projects in two of the cities that are currently funded. We're gonna be moderated today by Joe Kuczynski, who's the Director of Business Development at Symposium Headline Sponsor and IBI member, Pearl Earth. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Joe Kuczynski, Director of Business Development for Pure Earth in the Americas. I am joined today for uh, with Jonathan Malmberg uh, and Sam Dunlap. Uh, Jonathan is a Sweden-based consultant in the areas of biochar, urban vegetation systems, and green roofs. He's the former head of Scandinavian Green Roof Institute and a botanical roof gardener for the last eight years. Today, Jonathan works on Eco, at Ecotopic, a consulting company that helps organizations to get started with producing and using biochar, and also with the startup company BioCoal Productor, selling biochar products, including for soil and concrete. Sam Dunlap is the owner of Carbon Harvest LLC and is working with the city of Cincinnati to develop their urban biochar system. His background is in agriculture and education. Before starting Carbon Harvest, he co-founded and ran an indoor farming business in Cincinnati that grew specialty produce for customers in an area that spread from Chicago to Nashville to Pittsburgh. He left that business to refocus on soils and soil-based carbon for climate mitigation. So very much looking forward to their presentations um, on urban pathways for using biochar. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to Jonathan and we'll have some time for questions at the very end. Hi everyone, excellent. So we can start with the first slide. So Joe gave an excellent introduction to me. So um, I'm, <clears throat> my main uh, experience as working with urban plant beds and vegetation system comes from my time at the Scandinavian Green Roof Institute with several projects and I started to get interested in biochar the last uh, two three years. Now I'm super happy to be able to, to work with Matthias and Lotta uh, at Ecotopic and we also have a startup the Eco Productor. I will give you a glimpse of what's happening in Sweden um, as sort of an extension and um, a ripple of, of waves, if you could say like that, uh, from what's, from the Stockholm Biotrop project. We can take the next slide. So <clears throat> um, the largest current project um, on Biotrop in Sweden is a national project funded by uh, the Swedish Innovation Agency, where which is called Residues to Best Use, or Rest Till Best in Swedish. Um, <clears throat> Here we look at um, managing different uh, residues uh, like park and garden waste, sludge, algae, and seaweed. And then um, we look at the paralysis process and then not the, the, perhaps uh, the most important part, according to me, <laughs> is uh, the usage of the biochar then in green solutions in urban environment. Uh, as one of the fields where I work most with. Uh, so we can take the next slide. <clears throat> so why use biochar in urban soils and substrates? And most of you are, aware, are familiar with the benefits of biochar, but let's quickly skim this through. Um, 
it will improve the water availability and increase drought tolerance. It will improve nutrient availability that we are sure of that. Um, uh, you will have, uh, you will f foster and have the better mycorrhiza growth. We can clean stormwater. Uh, we can reduce leaking of nutrients and we can also, of course, create a carbon sink. So in the REST project, with, which been already been running for more than three years, we can say that we, in one way or another, uh, can um, see this through scientific results or practical experience from multiple cases, uh, both within the project, but also uh, in Sweden. And of course, as most of you are, I mean, aware of is depending on, on the quality of the biochar. Let's put the next slide. <clears throat> um, so in the project of Rest the Best, we've been looking at and, and develop systems for urban trees, um, grasslands, such as lawns or in urban meadows, uh, green roofs, living walls, football fields, and rain gardens. And I'm giving, going to give you a glimpse on some of these examples. Um, next, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, you heard a little bit about the Stockholm Bytra project, which is sort of, I mean, the, the background for all urban usage in Sweden, at least. Um, we, and the structural soil of Makadam and the filling with biochar and compost is really the, the, the common practice of creating plant beds for, for urban trees in Stockholm today. But increasingly for other types of vegetations as well. <clears throat> the, one of the main, the, I mean, I've been working with different soils and substrate for that now 10 years. And one of the major benefits for these systems is really to be able to manage stormwater and, and then use this system as part of climate mitigation. You can take the next, next slide. <clears throat> this is a picture of um, a friend of, of mine uh, produced for a project we work with, we work together with in the stock in central Stockholm, and <clears throat> this really uh, uh, exemplifies what, what what's what we can do. Um, this is then a, a central part of Stockholm with non permeable deck. It's concrete, and here we are combining this vegetation system with sort of an urban drainage. It, it it becomes it acts as both at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> next slide. And in the Rest to Best project, uh, one of the project partners uh, is a landscape for architectural firm that develop, took this to the nev next level. And they've been doing that for about three or four years right now. Uh, they call it the blue gray green system with biochar. There is a, a guideline you can find at the link below, bluegreengray.edges.se. It's also available in English. Uh, so <clears throat> basically what they do, they, they, they use this capacity to manage lots of lots of stormwater that we have in this Stockholm style <laughs> plant bed. And uh, they, we put the plant bed not, not only under the the trees, but also under parking areas. And in this case, uh, under the middle part, you know that you see the section, the middle section of the road, creating a, a vast and long um, uh, uh, sort of um, stone gravel, gravel, uh, sorry, no, stone grave. What do you say in English? Well, in, in uh, uh, you have a lot of, lots of, lots of pour to, pores to be filled up with water. And <clears throat> here they they take the take it to the next level, and then excluding uh, the compost, only using biochar in large sections here to to maximize the amount the amount of water the volume they can store. They also have quite intricate systems uh, where part of this water is stored, and then um, through uh, uh, capillary force will be used by the plot the trees all right so we take the next slide 
<clears throat> so this system is now being built throughout Sweden, mainly in in south, south here where I live in southern Sweden. There's lo lots of streets being built this way. So you see this narrow plant bed, but it's really really just a small part of the of the plant bed and and the and the water storing capacity and the area where we we have biochar. So it could it continues the way that you see saw on the previous picture. Uh, this was installed in 2022, and we had uh, the opportunity to deliver the substrate in this case, which is uh, biochar macadam, green waste compost, and some stone dust. And the stone dust is used to have a little bit slow, slower infiltration. All right, we take the next slide. <clears throat> in the project, we also looked at biochar as soil improver. We can like, take the next slide. And we have, uh, now we are starting to reach uh, uh, more or less 20 cases within the project where where we have, where we use biochar as a, a soil improvement, improvement. I should say there are 50 partners in the project. So it's quite, quite big. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of the partners are doing their different trials. This is one of my favorite trials um, because it's really see what biochar can do in urban soils. Um, for improving drought tolerance. If you take the next slide. Next. Oh, so, sorry. No, uh, previously. Oh, previously. I, my, my, I, my computer was lagging a bit. Okay. Excellent. So <clears throat> this, uh, this small pocket park was installed in uh, 2014. And in 2018, we had a really, really severe drought. In, in 2019, we also had a drought, not that severe, but quite bad as well. And half of this uh, uh, pocket park, if you like, uh, was uh, uh, planted with uh, 15 volume percent of biochar mixed into the soil. And we, I took this aerial uh, footage uh, in in the summer 2019, and you can actually see, or um, uh, uh, the, the the big difference between where we have put biochar and not. You can take the next slide now. Also, <clears throat> in 2018, we can see the Prunus sargenti, and uh, also, for example, Prunus uh, seracifera. Sorry, my Latin uh, grow. Uh, really much uh, more in than than the trees the same, the same species without without uh, biochar so you see the the uh, the, the picture above uh, or sorry the graph um, graphics above show where you have uh, the black is with biochar and the orange is without biochar and then you can see the effect in 2018. So sort of uh, biochar propaganda. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the project partners, uh, Skånefra, um, is using now biochar uh, for improving soccer fields, both both new and, and old ones. Um, and this was the first, one of the first that was done uh, four years ago in Lund, and now it, they are spreading this as a uh, within their business a quite common practice to utilize biochar for for new establishment of soccer fields. Just to give you an example, the next slide. Um, another example of of the increased usage of biochar is that Sweden's largest uh, green roof company is using biochar in uh, their cedar mats, and they are doing this on quite large scale. So they are <clears throat> aiming at that a majority of their products should be with biochar. You can take the next slide and I'm uh, soon finished. I see my time is running out. Another thing we look at in the project, which is also uh, something that is being, um, is a little bit new, more new, more newer, a, a bit of a newer invention, Sorry, my English. 
um, but I think you understand what I mean, is to use only by chart and aggregates. And this is something we've been looking at a couple of years. Um, so we have crushed stones mixed with crushed concrete, crushed bricks, and create this urban substrates for perennial plantings, uh, also green walls, where we also add some cumulus, I should say. You can take the next slide. Uh, and this is something that we've been, been doing within the project. You can take, this is uh, then the concrete biochar and a pinch of gravel, and you can take the next slide. But it's definitely not only within our trials in the project. This is on large scale. Um, this, this is my last uh, slide. Uh, it's with the crushed bricks, only biochar, no compost, recycled stones, could be, could be macadam as well, and a pinch of gravel. And um, and this is uh, we have been selling this for for a couple of projects this year to to use uh, different mixtures with only biochar and no compost and then uh, no peat and then only crushed aggregates and and, and biochar and gave, having great results. So that's a little bit a uh, glimpse of what's happening in Sweden. Sorry if I took more time than I should. Okay, Nick, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was very fascinating. I particularly enjoyed the, the green roofs, the applications in the soccer field, uh, and so many different places to use biochar in the city. We've got some good questions here, but first uh, let's move on to Sam. Hello, can everybody hear me, see me? We're good? Okay, um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm gonna speak about what's going on in Cincinnati, but also in Lincoln and Minneapolis uh, to some extent as they're uh, in our cohort, I'll say, with uh, the Bloomberg grant that we all received. Um, next slide. So um, just to, to kind of set, set the context here, um, I see biochar as a, an appropriate technology for urban application and CO2 removal. Um, I think there's some debate out there about the most effective, scalable, and financially viable ways to draw down CO2, but um, and just where those are most appropriate. But I think we can all agree that biochar has its places where it's extremely valuable and appropriate, and I'd argue that urban settings can be a very appropriate point of production and application. Um, there's both extensive and intensive, intensive approaches when it comes to carbon accumulation, uh, or sequestration, and they have different co-benefits that may make one better suited to the context than another. Um, so I think our solution should match the context and the opportunity, and I think uh, the urban environment is a great uh, place in which to do that. Uh, cities are defined by density. Uh, our activities there tend to create a concentrated impact, um, so I think we can match that with a concentrated solution, uh, which is biochar. Uh, urban centers are also point sources for waste and resources, and so there's uh, creates a concentration of feedstock as well as opportunities for utilization of both char and the heat and energy. And then cities have climate action and sustainability plans. I, I don't know any city without one these days, so uh, I think it's biochar is a high impact solution to match those, and it kind of tease it up uh, to create a, a context in which biochar is something that will be looked favorably upon. Uh, and then, of course, each city is unique and requires its own approach. Um, so the ways in which a successful biochar program can be established and maintained will, will of course, look different as well. So I'll try to look at a, little, a few of those differences between our cities as I go. Um, next slide. Uh, so as you heard uh, referenced, uh, I think everybody on this webinar um, symposium knows about the, the Stockholm Biochar Project, but that's sort of where it all began from the Bloomberg perspective. Um, Bloomberg supported the Stockholm Project in 2014 and then had been very pleased with results and created a grant in 2021 to replicate that. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, just a graphic of how it works in Stockholm, but uh, essentially, um, as we heard uh, Wendy kind of cue it up in the beginning, uh, plant waste collected from both residential and municipal sources um, turned into biochar that the heat and energy is tapped 
from that process and then it's distributed back into the the city um, and used in several different ways next slide uh, so when it comes to replication, this was the initial set of uh, cities. There was it was a two-stage grant process. So these are the ten cities that um, got the, the technical assistance grant, which was step one, and then um, the field narrowed a little bit in phase two. Um, it's down to seven of the cities moved into the financial award round. So in the U.S., that's Cincinnati, Lincoln, Nebraska, and Minneapolis. Um, so uh, go ahead, next slide. So the three of us uh, cities, I mean, we're all, we have quarterly um, events where we're all the cities are talking, but uh, the US cities, we're working very closely together as a cohort to learn from one another and develop resources in common. And our plan is to leverage that development effort as an opportunity to integrate it with the work of USBI and extend the network of learning, collaboration and implementation and scale the impact of our projects collectively. So uh, we're trying to uh, dovetail what's going on in our cities with you know, other cities around the country that are also uh, working on biochar development. Uh, and in that uh, vein, I'd like to just give a big thanks to Bloomberg for their financial support, the folks in Stockholm who've been a source of learning for us, Jim in Minneapolis, Frank and Nash in, uh, in Lincoln, Chuck Hegberg, spent a lot of time with me um I, he gave a great presentation yesterday and then tom miles uh, has also spent a great deal of time with me so appreciate all of the assistance from everyone um next slide so the goals of the urban biochar task force um are as follows i'm not going to go through each one of these uh, you can give them a brief scan but uh, essentially just trying to as i said leverage the work that we're doing together in a formalized way through the Bloomberg grant uh, to expand and make resources available to, to others and connect with others doing similar things. Uh, next. Okay, so in Cincinnati, um, I mentioned every city is different. You know, we got to couch it in our city's context. So the, the starting point for us is the Green Cincinnati Plan. It's our city's roadmap to sustainability. Um, and it's currently under revision. And um, so there'll be a new one coming out in 2023. But um, our work right now is trying to really, really couch our biochar project in, you know, it's kind of like uh, looking at the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Lots of folks will reference that and, you know, biochar fits in with goals X, Y, and Z. Uh, we're doing that same thing with the Green Plan Cincinnati. Uh, next. Okay, so we see it as a strategy for, see biochar that is, for as a strategy for meeting some of the goals of the Green Cincinnati Plan, um, including expansion of the urban canopy. I'll talk about the low-income neighborhoods in a minute, um, emissions reduction, stormwater management, and I, I think there's been good airtime given to that and the, the beneficial impacts that biochar can have in regards to stormwater. So I'm not going to get into the details on these, but these are the places that we want to leverage biochar to have an impact, uh, green infrastructure, uh, urban gardens, and generally, um, you know, the, the overarching goal of the Green Cincinnati Plan is an 80% reduction in emissions. I, I think that last slide said by 2050. Um, so as part of that climate resilience strategy. And just a key principle of turning waste into resource revenue and resilience. Next. Okay, so um, in our city, uh, as I'm sure most cities around the country and the world, um, there, there's a very distinct heat island effect. And um, it shows up disproportionately in low income neighborhoods. And um, this is one of the, it's a really big um, point of focus in our city and with our current mayor's um, agenda, really want to have an impact on that. So we, we really want to try to couch our, our biochar efforts uh, in, in trying to help remedy this particular issue, first and foremost, uh, with a 40% expansion of the urban tree canopy. Next slide. Okay, so uh, each of our cities, uh, the projects are sort of coming through a different department. They look a little different. For ours, uh, it's coming through the parks department. So the general concept is we take wood chips um, from the parks department and we've got a few partner tree companies um, to also supply feedstock. 
turn it into biochar. Uh, that's me when I was presenting at the U.S. Biochar Conference. Um, I, I was speaking uh, in the hopes of sealing the deal here, and I have since sealed the deal. So I'm officially um, contracted to be the operator for the Cincinnati Biochar Project. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so we'll pre so this is a public-private partnership model. Um, the other cities, Lincoln may or may not do that. Um, they may run their biochar in-house. Um, Minneapolis, I think they're doing it in-house as well. Um, but essentially, then we need to take that biochar uh, for all of the previous city uses that I've mentioned, and um, and then have some external sales as well to generate revenue. Um, Part of that, a key strategy for viability is building a market from within the city by harnessing the buy-in that has already been achieved. Um, Jim and, and the guys in Lincoln, uh, they're, they're all doing a really fabulous job of this. Uh, Jim in Minneapolis is really tapping into the Department of Transportation, um, looking at their uh, water treatment, their, their various protocols, um, and trying to get biochar written into the engineering specifications for uh, stormwater remediation. And um, so that's kind of, I think, an advantage of having the city buy-in on the front end is it gives us some credibility within the city to, um, to build a market and, you know, in, instantaneously, hopefully, uh, tap that purchasing power of both the city itself and the county and state as well. Um, I, I hope that the USDA and RCS uh, soil carbon amendment will be part of that as well, um, building some uh, uh, funding stream that we can meet with our, our tap into with our biochar production. And then, of course, uh, carbon credits will be part of that revenue stream as well. Um, next slide. So, um, one thing I wanted to say here is just that the goals of what we want to do with our biochar are really defined by the partners that that are at the table and the, the political administration. Um, so these are some of the, the key areas that we want to um, to emphasize with our biochar program. And uh, next slide. Actually, I meant to mention compost as one of those. Um, we have kind of an interesting, um, you know, Lincoln has its own composting program, municipal composting. So they are going to uh, meld their biochar program with the composting. Um, Minneapolis, they have a collaboration with a tribal partner um, and are going to, I think, include biochar as part of that compost program. For us, we don't have a municipal biochar program, or excuse me, composting program. There's one envisioned and it's very much demanded by the citizens, but um, it's currently not in, in existence. So um, there is, however, um, a, a compost project in the works with the county parks. The, this project, the biochar, is coming through the city park system. Um, Cincinnati is within Hamilton County, and Great Parks of Hamilton County has a farm, a working farm, um, that produces 900 tons of manure and bedding a year. So uh, they are working on a compost program to deal with that, and we are working to integrate those two projects uh, to the benefit of both. And uh, I mentioned, you know, the partners coming to the table uh, to make the project happen. These are some of them. Um, yeah, I'll, next slide. Uh, so the current status, um, we're trying to build awareness, build project uh, partnerships um, before, you know, the full scale biochar production is uh, probably a year out. Um, so in the meantime, we're trying to build these partnerships, build um, awareness around biochar. Uh, one of my friends, the guy on the crutches there on the left hand side, um, he has a burn boss, uh, which... Uh, can be used similarly to the char boss. It doesn't have the, uh, you know, the, the biochar that gets spit out automatically, but uh, it, it can be used to make biochar. So we brought it up and um, this is a, a youth, uh, the Groundwork Ohio River Valley is a very vibrant nonprofit in our city. And they do a lot of uh, youth development, youth employment programs, uh, specifically um, in a you know, nature-based setting. Uh, so this is our, our burn day with the, the burn boss and uh, we're working on uh, plans for the, the coming year to start putting the biochar that we're gonna 
create um, into use. Um, and then the other work that we're doing collaboratively across the cities right now is evalu evaluating technology and preparing for the procurement process, which is uh, somewhat riddled with red tape. So it's, it's going to be a, a lift and we're all trying to help each other out on that. And then finally, we're working on developing our communications and marketing plan to set the stage for a successful launch. Um, and that's, that's what I've got. Uh, I think next slide. Is there anything else? Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to, uh, be in the chat room after this. Um, so advance the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's just my contact info. If anybody is interested in, uh, learning more, connecting in with this biochar network, um, would love to, to talk with you. So there is my email address. Sam at carbonharvestllc.com. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Sam. Great presentation. Very interesting to hear about what's going on in Cincinnati and across the United States and different municipalities that are forward looking and uh, a bit progressive with this. So that's nice to see. Um, we do have a few questions here. So hopefully we can get some of these answered. Um, First of all, just curious, and this goes for both you and Jonathan, um, has it been quantified sort of how much water can be retained when biochar is applied in, in different applications around the city? If it's been quantified how much water, <clears throat> well, the, the system that are, that are being designed, they then we've quantified and there and there is a quantification of of the amount of water but it's not depending on the biochar really it's it's you know you you, you with the biochar you get the opportunity to build systems that are really really porous um and then we can have lots of lots of water in that those systems uh but, but i mean only a, a, a part of the water is in the in the biochar it's it's in the rest of the porous volume that we can create so it's more like the biochar is a is a tool for creating these kind of systems and then the systems themselves can store a lot of water okay yeah um there was a different question related to this as to whether there are any hydrologic models uh that can speak to the amount of runoff water runoff reduction uh um, yeah so forth yeah, there, there are, but I, 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 I'm, I, this is not my expertise uh, doing these calculations, but I can put you in contact um, with those that are interesting or more, more or better to look at the, the link that I added for the edge system, because this, this firm, this uh, consultancy firm, they really took this to the next level and they have calculated how much water and how much pore space they get with this um the stockholm plant bed look like but taken to the next level you could say okay thank you i would um, only add that uh chuck hegberg's presentation from yesterday he, he's really uh in the weeds on this issue and has a lot of the hydrologic models and graphs that show the stormwater uh runoff attenuation and uh he's got he's full of good information on that so uh, i would refer folks to to his presentation Thank you, Sam. Uh, and I was curious, you had mentioned that there is a certain amount of red tape within these different municipalities. Um, curious how receptive the cities have been and sort of, you know, what the outlook is for getting over, you know, past some of these hurdles uh, to get more biochar out there. Um, the city's been receptive. It's just the way, th you know, the, the parks department, it, it, there's different pathways to achieve the same end result. So, uh, just for example, if they want to get a, a chipper, a new chipper for the, the tree crew, uh, they go through fleet services and that can take, they'll be waiting on their chipper for three years um, before it gets through procurement. Uh, so the alternative to waiting on our biochar system for three years is running it as an RFP, a request for proposals, but um, not, I think, and that's how I had to get my contract to be the operator. Um, not every biochar equipment manufacturer, I think, is chomping at the bit to reply, respond to a city's RFP process. They're fairly involved. So um, 
that would somewhat fast track it. I think fast track is kind of a, a laughable term in that sense, but it's um, it's faster than three years. So uh, the challenge that we're having is how do we, we need more than just the pyrolysis equipment. We need the pre-processing equipment too. And those come from different manufacturers. How can we bundle all those together into a single RFP um, that, that responds to the need for all of that equipment simultaneously? So it's not so much the city bogging things down intentionally in regards to this project. It's just, you know, conforming our needs to the structure that exists. Okay, cool. Well, I think we basically do need to wrap it up, but there is one other question here that I think is, is actually very relevant for me here in North Carolina, where we have very clay, clay soils, uh, a lot of water kind of issues going on here. But somebody's asking if you can, if you can kind of put plugs of biochar in soil, like in clay type soil, and have that be another way of sort of absorbing water. And if, if that's true, then I will definitely do that in my backyard. <laughs> can, can you repeat again, Joe? Sorry. I... It, is, it, is it possible to, to actually take like plugs of biochar and just put that, insert that into the soil, um, similar to like an aeration type process? It is. Jonathan, you're probably more, I'll, I'll give you a first crack at it here. Well, uh, I mean, there is we, we, we within the project, one of my um, project <laughs> colleagues did a trial with really clay soil, um, putting in a mass amount of biochar and having improved uh, the plant for the trees. I don't know if that's a good, but maybe, yes. But did you say what, how do you, lo lots of biochar, plugs. Yeah, uh, plugging, Chuck plugging, uh, plugging it in. He, uh, yeah. Chuck's done some work where he has a uh, pneumatic um, aeration yeah. device. I, I forget what it's called, but uh, yes, uh, yeah, that, 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 yes, it, it, it can penetrate up to six feet deep, uh, and then we, I, I we, think he's trying to retrofit it to backfill with biochar. Um, and he's combining that with detention ponds um, as well, so that uh, they they actually release the water when they're supposed to because uh, they were having trouble with their compact and clay soils. Um, the water would just sit there and, and not go anywhere. Um, and, and so they, they did this um, penetration process, I think combined with a tilling it in, tilling biochar into the top 12 inches as well to get uh, water to actually uh, the, the feature, the engineering structure to function as it was. So yes, I'd say a short answer. Yes. Again, yeah. look at now I now I understand. Plug. Yeah, we did we did that in 2019 within the project as well, and and um, it's being uh, evaluated. So we don't know we don't have the results, but that's po that's possible to do. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, I wish we actually had time for all these questions because I'm intrigued to to learn more. But um, I think you've provided your email addresses. I'm sure you guys won't be. Very happy to answer questions or have some follow-up calls going forward, but maybe in the chat after this, uh, whoever is available, and we can carry it on there. But thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.